Hello. So let's continue from where we left off last time. Let us recall that last time we were discussing the Aries function. What's the Aries function? The Aries function is a solution of the Aries differential equation y double prime minus xy equal to 0. Now we took the Fourier transform of this differential equation and we got a first order ODE and we solved this first order ODE and the solution was exponential of i chi cube and we applied formally the inversion theorem and we got the function y of x equal to integral over r x of i x chi plus i chi cube. The problem with all this derivation was that it was completely formal. We do not know that the Aries differential equation admits a solution which can be Fourier transformed. We do not know whether the Fourier transform y hat which we obtained as x of i chi cube in what sense can we take the inverse transform because exponential of i chi cube does not decay or anything. So there are certain issues with this derivation but the positive aspect of it is that we got an integral, we got an integral representation y of x equal to integral over r cosine x chi plus chi cube dx. Let us get to the slides 4.18 that you see in the slide. So this equation 4.18 is supposed to give us a solution of the Aries equation but the derivation of 4.18 was suspect. There is one way out of it. One possible option is to take 4.18 and directly check that it satisfies the Aries equation by differentiation. But there again there is a certain problem because if you try to differentiate 4.18 with respect to x, y prime of x will be integral over r minus sin x chi plus chi cube and a chi will be produced, y double prime will be minus integral over r cosine x chi plus chi cube times chi squared. We have picked up factor of chi and chi squared in two successive derivations and the integrand not only is not bounded anymore, it is actually becoming infinite. So it is oscillating with large amplitudes chi squared. So direct verification is going to be problematic. So let us make a transformation. First let us discuss whether the integral even converges conditionally. Integral 4.18, it is not at all clear that even this integral even conditionally convergent. First we will prove that it is conditionally convergent. After that we will make a transformation and convert this conditionally convergent integral 4.18 into an absolutely convergent integral and we will work with a transformed integral and check that that transformed integral satisfies the Aries equation and that is the plan of today's lecture. Okay, so first let us make a change of variables x chi plus chi cube equal to s. The function x chi plus chi cube as a function of chi is monotone increasing beyond a certain stage r infinity. It is not monotone on the entire real line. And why do we need monotonicity? Because when we make a change of variables, the change of variables must be a bijective mapping. So we want it to be strictly increasing or strictly decreasing here because of chi cube, we expect it to be strictly increasing and it will be increasing beyond a certain stage r to infinity. The corresponding value of s will be capital R. When you make a change of variables in this integral, we are going to put x chi plus chi cube equal to s and that is how we got a cos s and x plus 3 chi squared d chi will be ds. So d chi will be ds upon x plus 3 chi squared that is 4.19. Now we have the unpleasant task of transforming this into a integrand involving 
s alone. Solving this cubic for chi and substituting it here is going to be a difficult task and it is actually not necessary. First let us make some simple observations. Let us look at this equation x chi plus chi cube equal to s on this large interval r to infinity. As chi goes to infinity, s must also go to infinity. And conversely, if s goes to infinity, then chi must go to infinity. That is the first little observation. So now let us do the following. Let us try to integrate by parts in 4.19. So let us write down cos of s equal to the derivative dds of sin of s with a minus sign and throw the derivative on the other factor. And we have to apply the chain rule to differentiate 1 upon x plus 3 chi squared. You know, differentiate with respect to s, you are going to pick a 1 upon x plus 3 chi squared the whole squared into d chi by ds. And of course, when you apply the chain rule, you will pick up a 6 chi s also. d chi by ds, you will have to calculate using the equation connecting s and chi. But now we will not need to do any further simplifications because we must understand the behavior of this chi upon x plus 3 chi squared the whole cube. I have suppressed the boundary terms that arise from integration by parts. You can figure out what happens to the boundary terms because it is this integral that we are concerned with and we want to show that this integral 4.20 is convergent. So, as I said, we have the unpleasant job of expressing chi by x plus 3 chi squared the whole cube in, in terms of s, but that would be needed if we want an exact value of the integral. We do not want an exact value of the integral, we only want that the integral converges. And now what happens is that as chi becomes very large, s upon chi cube from this equation, we can see that s upon chi cube must go to 1 as chi goes to infinity. So for all large values of chi, s upon chi cube must lie between half and 2 for instance. And I simply use this inequality and raise it to the power 2 by 3 and I get another inequality. s to the power 2 thirds must be sandwiched between c chi squared and chi squared by c, where c is a certain positive constant. So now we get 3 chi squared plus x, that must be bigger than 3 by c s to the power 2 thirds plus x. But note that if chi is very large, then s will also be very large and x is fixed. So that 3 upon c s to the power 2 thirds plus x is ultimately going to be much larger than say s to the power half because 2 thirds is bigger than half and s is going to infinity. So we get this estimate chi upon 3 chi squared plus x the whole cube will be less than c times s to the power 1 third upon s to the power 2 thirds for instance and that is basically c times s to the power minus 7 by 6 and this estimate suffices to show that this integral here converges absolutely chi by x plus 3 chi squared the whole cube is dominated by s to the power minus 7 by 6 and since 7 by 6 is bigger than 1, 1 upon s to the power 7 by 6 integral converges and so this integral here in 4.20 converges absolutely. So we have completed the proof that the integral 4.18 is a conditionally convergent integral. Now that will not suffice for us, we need to go a little further and we will have to now transform that integral into an absolutely convergent integral. In other words, we must shift the contour of integration into the complex domain. This idea of shifting the contour of integration into the complex domain is a very frequently used idea in theory of differential equations. So now let us start with this entire function f of z equal to x of i x z plus i z cube. The chi has been replaced by z. Chi was real, z is complex. This is an entire function. Cauchy's theorem will tell you that the integral of an entire function over a rectangle 
is going to be 0. So let us choose the rectangle to have vertices minus r r r plus i eta minus r plus i eta. So the base of the rectangle is the interval minus r to r. So along the base of the rectangle the integral fz dz as r goes to infinity will give you the integral that you want. Okay. Then you have got to look at the vertical side from r to r plus i eta. The contribution from that vertical side will go to 0. And then we must look at the contribution from the other vertical side minus r to minus r plus i eta. That contribution will also go to 0. I am going to leave this verification for you as an exercise. And now we will have to look at what happens on the top of the rectangle from minus r plus i eta to r plus i eta. On the top edge of the rectangle, let us call it L2. The base of the rectangle is called L1. Cauchy's theorem has to be applied. Integral over L1 plus integral over L2 plus integral over V1 plus integral over V2 is 0. These integrals along the vertical sides go to 0. Integral along L1 gives you the integral that you want. And integral along L2 is what we are going to now find out. And we are going to finally get that integral over L1 fz dz is minus integral over L2 fz dz. I am going to allow the r to go to infinity. So the integral that we want is going to be written as limit as r goes to infinity integral fz dz along L2. It is this transformed integral that is going to be absolutely convergent. So let us now analyze this integral along L2. So along L2 z is what? z is chi plus i eta where chi varies from minus r to r and eta is fixed. Let us estimate this absolute value of x of i x z plus i z cube. It is going to be put z equal to chi plus i eta x is real remember they are going to get x of minus x eta plus eta cube minus 3 chi squared eta that is the real part. And then the imaginary part of course x of ic is going to be a unit complex number when c is a real number. So what is the estimate mod integral over L2 of x of i x z plus i z cube dz. That is going to be less than or equal to this factor e to the power minus x eta plus eta cube that does not depend on chi so that comes out an integral from minus r to r e to the power minus 3 chi squared eta d chi. Remember that eta is positive and chi is real varying between minus r and r. So this integral certainly converges and so this integral over L2 is a nice absolutely convergent integral and so let us write that down. So finally in the limit as r tends to infinity these two vertical pieces go to 0 the integral over L1 gives you the integral that you want and integral over L2 will be what we are going to write down on the right hand side of this displayed equation in detail that is over here. Integral minus infinity to infinity x of i x chi minus x eta plus i times chi plus i eta the whole cube d chi. The left hand side is of course the integral 4.18 that is the solution y x which we are going to check that is a solution, not yet a solution. We have heuristically arrived at that y of x by taking Fourier transforms. Now that we know that the y of x that we got is exactly this expression that is displayed on the right hand side. So the integral on the right hand side is going to be absolutely convergent and we can differentiate under the integral sign any number of times that we want e to the power minus x eta does not depend on chi at all, it comes out of the integral. Here let us look at the real part of this integral e to the power i times 3 chi squared i eta and so I get i squared which is minus 1 and I get chi squared eta. So that is exactly causes the integral to be absolutely convergent. So I get an e to the power minus 3 chi squared eta. That is the term that is going to help us. When you differentiate with respect to x, when you differentiate with respect to x, I am going to pick up 
factors like a chi because of e to the power i x chi here, for instance. I'm going to pick up an eta here, but eta is going to be constant. So though I pick up a factor of chi, I have e to the power minus 3 chi squared eta that's going to help us to cope with the integral. So we can differentiate under the integral sign without any problem. So let us differentiate under the integral sign twice with respect to x and let us calculate y double prime x minus x y by 3. That happens to be minus 1 upon 3 i integral minus infinity to infinity. We get 3 i z squared plus i x x of i x z plus i z cube. This chi plus i eta combination that appears here and it appears here has been replaced by z and this expression that we see inside we can write it as dd chi of x of i x z plus i z cube d chi. Now this integral is going to be 0 by the fundamental theorem of calculus and the rapid decay of the integrand as you go to infinity along the chi direction. So that shows that y double prime minus x y by 3 does indeed turn out to be 0. In other words, y of x is indeed a solution of the Aries equation. So the integral representation that we got gives you a valid solution of the Aries equation. And as far as estimates are concerned, you can use this transformed integral to get your estimates on the Aries function. I think we will close the discussion of Aries function here with just one small comment. It is elementary to obtain Aries equations as a power series solution. But the power series solutions are easy to get. They lend themselves to algebraic manipulations such as term by term differentiations and multiplication and stuff like that. It is very difficult to get information concerning their asymptotic behavior, zeros and such. Integral representations are much better. In fact, the integral representation of the Aries function gives you the asymptotic behavior of the Aries function. We won't get into that and that's important in optics. Now let us take up a few odds and ends before we take the next topic in this chapter on Fourier transforms. The riemann lebesgue lemma revisited. So let us start with an L1 function. We know that the Fourier transform of f decays to 0 as chi goes to plus infinity and chi goes to minus infinity. That is the riemann lebesgue lemma. Here I stated theorem 52. I said riemann lebesgue lemma revisited. Not only is the Fourier transform decaying to 0 as chi goes to plus minus infinity, the Fourier transform is actually a continuous function. Indeed, it is uniformly continuous and bounded. The proof will not be given in detail. I will give it as a guided exercise. First of all, f is in L1. Moment you say that f is in L1, it means outside an interval, the contribution of mod fx as an integral is vanishingly small. In other words, there exists an a bigger than 0 such that integral of mod fx dx outside the interval minus a a is less than epsilon by 4 where epsilon greater than 0 is arbitrarily chosen. So now let us write down the difference f hat of chi minus f hat of eta. I want to discuss the absolute value of this difference. So let us write the integral of f hat of chi and f hat of eta and the in integral is over mod x less than or equal to a plus another integral mod x greater than or equal to a. The two integrals are displayed over here. Now let us do the following. Let us look at the second integral and let us take the absolute value and take the absolute value inside the integral. Use triangle inequality. They are both unit complex numbers and so this modulus is less than or equal to 2. So that is an innocent constant. It comes out. And then I am left with mod fx dx and that is less than or equal to epsilon by 4, the integral. So I get the contribution from the second piece in all is less than epsilon by 2. Now let us concentrate on the first piece. 
Suppose I use the mean value theorem. Let us call this function g of t. So g of chi minus g of eta, right? You got a function evaluated at chi and the same function evaluated at eta. The mean value theorem will give you that the difference will be equal to chi minus eta times the derivative. When you differentiate, I'm going to pick up a minus i x. i is an innocent constant and x is a variable but mod x is less than or equal to a. So the x that you pick up is bounded by a. And then we get the derivative will be e to the power minus i x times theta for some theta between chi and eta. But that again is going to be a unit complex number. So when you try to estimate the first piece, you're going to get an a factor because you pulled out an x while differentiating. And then you got this mod fx dx. And you also have a chi minus eta. So you must choose the delta. So that delta should be less than epsilon by 4 times a. Then your chi minus eta will be less than epsilon by 4 times a. The a that you picked up will get cancelled out. And you will be able to show that the first piece is also less than epsilon by 2. So we have proved that given any epsilon greater than 0, there is a delta greater than 0 and I told you what the delta is just now. So that the mod of f hat chi minus f hat of eta is less than epsilon as soon as chi minus eta is less than delta in absolute value. That proves that the function is uniformly continuous. Okay. Now let us take the series of exercises. Use Parseval formula to compute the integral from minus infinity to infinity for sine squared chi d chi upon chi squared. What does the Parseval formula give you? The Parseval formula gives you this beautiful equation, the L2 norm of f squared and the L2 norm of f hat squared are related just by multiplication by 1 upon 2 pi. Now, if you know a function whose Fourier transform is 2 sin chi by chi, if you look at the list of Fourier transforms that we have calculated, you will find that there is a function whose Fourier transform is exactly 2 sin chi by chi. So this integral that you see, the displayed integral is exactly norm f hat squared. And that's the integral that you're trying to calculate. But the original function was much simpler. What was it? It was nothing but the characteristic function of the interval. So you just have to understand what is the integral of f squared where f is the characteristic function of the interval and you use the Parseval formula and you calculate this integral. That shows the use of Parseval formula. The Parseval formula has many uses in the next capsule, we will prove the equipartitioning of energy in the wave equation and we will again use the Parseval formula. Then a couple of exercises on convolution. Use the convolution theorem to determine the convolution fs star f of t where fs is the Cauchy distribution. What is the, what is the formula for fs? s upon chi squared plus s squared with the 1 upon pi thrown in. S is a parameter, S is a parameter and chi is the variable of the function. So this 1 upon pi is a factor which is a convenience factor because when you integrate this f of s over the real line you will get 1. So this is called the Cauchy distribution in probability theory. But this Cauchy distribution turns out to be the Fourier transform of some known function capital Fs. Again, you should go back and look at the list of Fourier transforms in the early part of this chapter and you will be able to find which function capital F is it whose Fourier transform is this Cauchy distribution. Now, if you know that, then this convolution is easy to calculate. If without that, if you try to calculate the convolution, it's going to be a messy integration. But instead of calculating the convolution directly from the definition, try to calculate the Fourier transform of the convolution. 
and then once you get the Fourier transform of the convolution, then you try to use the inversion theorem. That approach may be much simpler than directly computing the convolution. The next exercise is another Fourier transform computation. Cosh Ax, A is a positive real number and we know that 1 upon cosh Ax is a rapidly decreasing function. It is an element of the Schwarz class. It's an element of the Schwarz class. So how to calculate the Fourier transform? Is there a way to calculate the Fourier transform? Yes, there is a way to calculate the Fourier transform. Cosh Ax is an even function. 1 upon cosh Ax is an even function. So when you write down the definition of the Fourier transform, only the cos chi x upon cosh ax term will survive. The sin chi x upon cosh ax will disappear. It's an odd function. Again, you must use complex analysis to do this. Usually, when you have a hyperbolic function in the denominator, what you will do is that you will employ a rectangular contour. Again, the rectangular contour will have base as the interval from minus r r. And the contribution for the vertical sides r to r plus i t minus r to minus r plus i t the two vertical sides the contribution will go to 0 and integral along the base is the integral uh, that you want as r goes to infinity. What happens to the integral along the top edge of the rectangle? What is the top edge of the rectangle? How would you choose this t in such a way that at the top along the top edge you get a multiple of the integral that you want. So along the top edge what is z? z is x plus i t where x goes from minus r to r. So when you put cosh of a into x plus i t you must get a multiple of cosh. It, the t must be what? The t must be pi by a. In that case you will get cosh of ax plus i pi. Cosh of ax plus i pi is minus cosh ax and you will get that the integral along the top of the rectangle is a multiple of the original rectangle. I think it's a good place to stop this lecture here. We'll continue in the next capsule. Thank you very much.